Um, <laughs> first, I have to, you know, I haven't, I've only lived in this country for 32 years, but you will understand that I speak funny. Um, uh, the fact is, I came here much too old to change, and so I didn't. <laughs> but I, and what I want to be sure is that if you can't understand what I'm saying, if I, I won't use methyl group, I'll say methyl. <laughs> I, I learned that much. But if I say tomato for any reason, I don't think it, I shall need to, but um, you know, if you're puzzled, I'd rather you interrupt and say, what on earth are you talking about? You'll do that? I hope. Um, Betsy asked me to give two lectures. Uh, well, maybe I offered even. You asked me to give one, and I, what I want to do today and on Thursday is first to give you a, a sense of what an enzyme does, a very small, very simple reaction, chemically, but as we shall see in a moment, biologically very important. Um, what it does first, and then on Thursday, how it does it. At least, I'm not going to pretend that we understand enzyme catalysis. We don't. But, you know, we're getting there. And I'd like you to see where, at least I think, we are. Because your course, the course we're in, you're in, <laughs> uh, and I'm in now, uh, is about mechanism, basically. It's how things happen, isn't it? And mechanism is more than just knowing how fast things happen. How, so if I want to know, if I've got a reactant A and it's going to B, then I want to know how fast, of course, that, I mean, if I want to know, understand it, I want to know the rate constant. But also, of course, I want to know, uh, just knowing the rate constant is one number. What's the point of that? I mean, it's just a number. It's not really a very great fundamental interest. You don't learn any new concept from a number, at least. That's an exaggeration, but um, we'll leave the physicists alone for a moment. Um, you also need to know, to give it some clothes, some structure, to know what's going on, to know what the pathway is, to know whether, in fact, A doesn't <coughs> go to B at all but goes to an intermediate I, which then goes to B, and now I've got two rate constants to worry about. And those, and a mechanism is knowing both all about the rate constants and knowing the pathway, and third, and knowing the nature, the structure, the chemical nature of A, I, and B. That's what mechanism is, at least in my view. We want to know it all. And what I'm saying is that today and Thursday, I'd like to give you at least a glimpse of what we think we know, <coughs> excuse me, about one enzyme. <coughs> For those of you who are puzzled, um, <coughs> or who become puzzled, there is, for today's lecture, um, a summary, a reasonable summary, in accounts of chemical research, um, 19... 77, yes, before any of you were born. But, you know, it's not that long ago <coughs> for some of us. Um, volume 10, page 105. And that's a review. It's only about six pages. Um, and if you don't understand something, or you find next week when I've gone home um, that you really don't understand something, and your loyal teaching fellows and your p wonderful professor, um, uh, of whom more later, um, didn't explain it, go, to go there and find out. And if you really get stuck, email me. But you better be really stuck before you do that. <laughs> um, here <coughs> then, and I think I'll try turning off the board lights so that it's not to allow you to slip. No, you can still see what you're writing. Yes, it's perfect. It's just a little easier on your eyes. Um, so today, energetics. Thursday, structure. So Thursday, actually, just in case, also, one more message. Um, as Betsy suggested, today is going to be a bit harder work for you than the Thursday. 
Thursday's a bit more descriptive, a bit, few more structures, pictures, things to look at. Um, so don't become too depressed after today's lecture, all right? So um, that's what we're going to do. This is how I think we all began. The enzyme is a black box. And the fact is, you can't see inside. I mean, how do we? The su it takes in a substrate, and the product's produced, and it's magic. And it's produced very rapidly. And um, that's the core of the problem for today. You all know, I trust, that what is on this slide, um, the speed with which enzyme reactions go is really enormous. Um, I don't know how much history, background, as it were, you've had, but enzymes in our bodies catalyze reactions, both fast ones, ones that reactions that are fast normally, like the hydration of carbon dioxide. You, you don't think, as chemists, do you, that a reaction like CO2 plus H2O going to uh, sodium by I mean, sorry, uh, carbonic acid. That's, that's, sorry, so I, I now I want you to read. Um, I'll stay on this side. Um, that's a very fast reaction. We have an enzyme to make it even faster by perhaps a thousand fold. Why? Because each time you breathe, what do you need to do? You need to breathe out CO2 and breathe in, of course, oxygen. But the carbon dioxide comes to your blood, of course, to your lungs as bicarbonate. And what you have to do before you can breathe, you can't breathe out sodium bicarbonate. <laughs> you can breathe out the gas, carbon dioxide. So you need to dehydrate it. It needs to have, go right to left very fast. And so that now you can exhale the CO2. That's the kind of reason that even for a fast reaction, that chemists would call a fast one, we've got to have, uh, we, we, we often need an enzyme. This is an example of a very fast reaction. But a, an example of a very slow reaction, <coughs> um, and Betsy, you'll have to tell me, if I said the phosphorylation of glucose, would they just wonder what on earth I was talking about? Um, I mean, if I take glucose, and do you know what glucose is? You've heard of it. <laughs> it's got hydroxyl groups on it. And if you took ATP, and you have heard of ATP? Yeah. yeah. All right. Sorry. You know, <laughs> forgive me. I'm not being insulting, but I don't want to totally to make you bemused. And, and this is catalyzed by reaction, uh, an enzyme called hexokinase. Um, and it, you get, it gives you a, one of the glucose phosphates, which I shall, um, plus, of course, ADP. That reaction, I mean, you can leave the, the glucose and ATP in a flask uh, for centuries, and you would get nothing of this. That reaction, this reaction is speeded up by perhaps, uh, I don't know, it depends how you count, 10 to the 3. This reaction has to be speeded up by something like 10 to the 15. Um, you really, um, th this is a, a, a very slow reaction, and that's a, a normally fast reaction. All I'm trying to say is, essentially everything that goes on in your bodies, in life, in living things, essentially every chemical reaction is, is catalyzed by an enzyme. That's rather, that's dealt with that first point, sort of. The second point is, of course, they're very clever. They're very discriminating. So you've got about 1,000, 800 or 1,000 small organic molecules in the cell. I mean, glucose is one, CO2 is another, and so on. Um, water is, is, I suppose, another, but ATP is another. You've got about 800 to 1,000 in the cell. Your enzyme has got to select just out of that mess of molecules it's just the ones it wants. And it's got to do it right, correctly, every time. And this final point is more, more um, sophisticated, perhaps. Uh, it's got to recognize uh, the difference uh, in stereospecific terms. Uh, and I will, I'll turn on the lights um, briefly to uh, give you one example. 
some of you will know what this molecule is, um, uh, ethanol. And these two hydrogens are different because, of course, um, uh, the, that carbon is tetrahedral, and you know these are probably, I hope you know, those are called prochiral hydrogens. There's an enzyme, alcohol dehydrogenase, which if you had a drink last night has, had better have been at work, uh, uh, oxidizing your alcohol, metabolizing your alcohol. That enzyme removes one, but not the other. With, and this in that particular case, with more than 10 to the seven-fold discrimination. So you imagine, imagine you've just got, um, if my wrist is the OH, you've got a methyl, and if, as you look at it, a right-hand hydrogen and a left-hand hydrogen, um, it knows the difference between these and doesn't make a mistake <coughs> more than one in 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 times. That's uh, all I'm trying to do is to, with this slide is to illustrate for you um, <coughs> how clever they are and how, why the study of enzyme reactions is an interesting one. Um, now, so if you're an enzymologist, you've got a thousand enzymes, um, a million enzymes, say, to choose from. Well, how can you choose? Do you just choose it round, throw a dart uh, at a metabolic pathways chart? No. <laughs> you, um, these are the criteria I used years ago. I said I want it to be very simple chemically, because if I, there's no point in making it more complicated than it has to be. It's obviously going to be challenging. I'd like it to be important. I'd like people to feel that I haven't just been scrubbing away in some backwater of metabolism. Uh, I'd like it to be a challenge, so I want an efficient enzyme to study. And I do want to know, I want to be able to put clothes on any reactions that we study, kinetics. And what we chose was the enzyme you've heard about, triosphosphate isomerase. But just before I get there, I want to, it's amazing, I don't need this, do I? No, not really. You don't, I mean, you, don't, you hardly see it anyway. <laughs> we'll see. Um, so this is a slightly abbreviated version of something called of glycolysis. And you know that if you are um, suddenly faced with a lion, you just have exited this classroom and there you are, you see a lion. Uh, what do you want? You want to run. <laughs> so does the lion um, uh, to uh, catch you, right? <laughs> so what you need is ATP. And the way you get instant ATP for what the biologists call fight or flight, either to get your lunch or to uh, escape being lunch, um, you ne what you do is to metabolize glucose or, in fact, glycogen. But here, if it, let's just for simplicity say you want ATP from glucose. Well, what happens in glycolysis is that glucose, far from, in the initial stages, far from making any ATP, you use one and then another to put a phosphate, one on each end of the glucose, which becomes fructose, but never mind. It's six carbons, and it's got a phosphate each end. So instead of, you know, here you are wanting ATP, and here's the lion wanting ATP, and all you're doing so far is used it up. <coughs> However, this six carbons is broken down, is broken up, I mean, cleaved into two, three carbon units, one of which, glyceraldehyde phosphate, goes on down to pyruvate and, in, and then ultimately to lactate in your muscle, which is what the stuff that makes your muscle, you, you're a bit stiff if you, after you run for a bit. Uh, so here we are, if glycolysis was like that, you'd burn up two ATPs and you'd get two back. And you and the lion would still be standing there. <laughs> um, actually, you wouldn't because you've got glycogen um, and you only burn up one from glycogen. So you'd get a net of one if you were starting to use your muscle glycogen. But for the fact of that fellow, this lovely little enzyme interconverts these two three carbon units so that now, instead of just using that one and getting two back, we use this one as well and get another two. So you're getting a net 
starting with glucose of two ATPs. And if you started with glycerol, oh, glycogen, you'd, you'd get a net of three. And now you're running, the lion is running, and evolution is uh, proceeding. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, whoever wins, wins. Um, the, my point is that <coughs> of this slide is that you would expect, I think you would, might even say you would predict, that over the last four billion years, while evolution has been rolling, there would have been a great pressure to have an efficient triosphosphate isomerase. I'll call it TIM, because one does and it's quicker. Um, uh, that enzyme, TIM, should have been, you would have think it was under great pressure to become very efficient, because it really is on that that the net ATP production in muscle depends. See? So you would expect, wouldn't you, this enzyme to be very efficient. And it is. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, here are some of the properties. It's a, it's got, it's a dimer, but the dimers don't talk to each other. Uh, so um, those of you who know about cooperativity and those things, um, don't worry. They, the, each uh, piece, each 25,000 unit, behaves as, as if the other fellow wasn't there. So, as I say, it's not, it's not cooperative, the two. Um, it requires no metals, no magic, no coenzymes, no activators. It just goes. See, I wanted something simple. And there's a crystal structure. And at the bottom, it is indeed very efficient. Uh, this is going in what will become the right to left, what you'll see in a moment I'm calling the right to left, the downhill direction. But the... Um, Okay, cat over KM, uh, I don't know if, have you got there yet? We did that. You did that. So that, that is a second order rate constant, so that if you like, that's just the rate of enzyme plus the substrate going to the product, enzyme plus product, and that's a second order rate constant with the units molar to the minus one, seconds to the minus one. And that's, I want you to remember that, four times 10 to the eight molar to the minus one, second to the minus one. That is a very, very, very fast reaction. Um, and just bear that in <coughs> mind that, yes, indeed, this enzyme has evidently become rather quick. Now let's have a little chemistry. You better know what the structures are. Here's, which you can see, there's acetone, except it's dihydroxyacetone phosphate. And here is the product, uh, here's the other one. This is, all the enzyme is doing is into converting these two, and that is uh, an aldehyde, it's glyceraldehyde, D-glyceraldehyde phosphate. And I put on this slide the, which is also important for, uh, in a minute, f the equilibrium amounts. It's, it's about 96 to 4. It isn't the, it isn't, you know, one of them isn't very unstable and the other one very stable. Um, it's about dihydroxyacetone phosphates, of course, a bit more stable than this aldehyde phosphate, but 96 to 4, it means actually that we can study this reaction, the top one and the bottom one, separately. And that's important. That, you will see in a minute, is important. So many reactions, you can only study in one direction. If you imagine uh, what chymotrypsin is doing to your breakfast at the moment, the enzyme in your stomach that is uh, hydrolyzing peptides, um, the, the bacon that you, the protein that you had for breakfast. I hope enough of you have breakfast. But um, that is a hydrolysis reaction where you're breaking peptides apart. You, you don't synthesize peptides. You, don't, you can't study the back reaction at all easily. Here, however, um, going forwards and backwards, we can do it uh, um, easily. And I've got a color code on this and for subsequent slides, so that when we're going to the left, appropriately enough, we, it's red. Um, um, <laughs> politically correct um, <laughs> designation. Um, we can start, so only uh, obliterate from your mind the blue arrows for a moment. Start with this as the substrate, and I'd like to study the reaction from right to left. I can add to a little triosphosphate isomerase, a lot 
of this enzyme, which nature happens to provide for other reasons we needn't bother with. And so as soon as any of this forms, I sweep it away irreversibly to a product, and it never comes back. And I, never, I don't study the back reaction at all. I'm just studying the right to left reaction. Alternatively, I can use a different enzyme and, and, and go left to right. Go just blue. So I start with this stuff and go convert to um, glyceraldehyde phosphate. And there's a dehydrogenase that takes that irreversibly. If I have a lot of this enzyme, then I can s study the blue. So what I'm trying to, I'm saying to you is I can go left, right to left or left to right separately. I mean, I decide, <coughs> I add that and I go blue, or I add that and I go red. And that is uh, particularly useful. Here's the reaction. And uh, you can see how very simple it is. Um, uh, and let's just pretend we're chemists. And we'd like to presume what this reaction really is. Well. It's very easy. You, 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 it doesn't need uh, any brilliance to decide how this reaction might work. Um, there is, on the left, dihydroxyacetone phosphate. I've drawn it out now, um, sort of slightly stereo, in a stereo sense, so you can see it. If I had a base here, then it could pull off a, that proton. And that's called an enolization, isn't it? You, you, you know all about the enolization of acetone. And I might, it might be helped with a, an acid cat catalyst here. But it's obviously very easy to go simply to enolize, taking off that hydrogen and putting it on there. And now I've got an enol. Actually, because of it's got two oxygens, it's called an enediol. But that would be that arrow. If I start at the right, what happens? There's this aldehyde, glyceraldehyde phosphate. So there's the aldehyde. If I take that proton off with a base, then all I've done is enolize that aldehyde, and I get to the same thing. So this reaction, catalyzed by Tim, looks like two enolizations, two enolizations back to back. And an enolization, going from acetone to its enol, there could hardly be anything simpler. After all, what am I doing? I'm just changing the place. Of, I'm really taking that proton, that hydrogen, and putting it on the middle carbon there, and taking that one on oxygen and putting it on there. It, it, it's just moving hydrogen around. Um, and there could hardly be, I think, um, anything much simpler than that. What that means is, if I'm going to have an indiol, an intermediate, I've now got an intermediate. It's a case like I, as I illustrated here. I've got a, 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 a new species, but the, the, this means the enzyme reaction has four steps. Because there's the enzyme, there's the dihydroxyacetone phosphate, they bind to make a complex. Now, Things happen. I mean, the protons, hydrogen is abstracted, and I get to the enediol. Then it goes to the product, enzyme product complex, which then dissociates. So I've got four steps to worry about. Um, and this is, I would like to know, therefore, the rates of all those four steps. How, do I, how might I think about it? Well, let's first take this material dihydroxyacetone phosphate, and with a little enzyme, and put it in tritiated water. Now, I've got to, be, I've got to admit to um, a slight sin. I say T2O. That's very wrong. Tritiated water is really ordinary water with a little tracer amount, one molecule of one hydrogen in 10 to the 10, say, will, will actually be tritium. You know the difference. Du D2O, deuterium oxide, is ever, there are no protons. It's all deuterium, it's D2O. But tritiated is, you, you, I mean, it, um, if you had T2O, 
it would glow in the dark. I mean, it would be so radioactive um, that you wouldn't want to get anywhere close. So forgive me for um, uh, um, using that, but just bear in mind, remember that tritium is a radioactive isotope in pinch trace amounts. What happens, and remember, I told you, at equilibrium, there's 96% of that. So most of, even when I add tin uh, to 100% of that, this goes down to 96%, and I got 4% of the other thing, but it's all in equilibrium. What you see is that there is a single tracer, a single tritium label incorporated into this. This is the same molecule, except now that one of those hydrogens has become labeled. It's stere and it's stereospecific. Remember my uh, alcohol here. Those two hydrogens are different. One's a left-handed one and one's a right-handed one, to be mm, speaking properly. They are prochiral hydrogens, and one of them, the pro-R hydrogen, as it happens, is labeled. So now, what I've done, all I've done is just use this as to make some labeled molecule. I've now got some radioactively labeled species, but it's labeled in one particular place. And this, I can use that as a substrate. And I can ask myself, since I know that that's the hydrogen that Tim uses, let's see if that hydrogen, when I go in the blue direction from left to right, let's see whether, I, since I know Tim will take that off, I'm going to do this reaction in ordinary unlabeled water, I'm going to ask, does that which the enzyme pulls off, does it put it back there? And then when I add the excess enzyme, I get some stable product I can, I, I can, identif I, I can isolate to see what the tritium content is there. So I want to know, is the tritium transferred between carbon-1 and carbon-2? Does the base pull it off, carry it over, and put it back? In which case, when I've labeled it with tritium, I'll see tritium there. Or does something else happen? Well, no, something else happens. <coughs> nearly all of it is lost. <coughs> nearly all of it is gone. So even though I start with the tritium label there, by the time I get to the product, it's essentially all gone. Actually, it's not all gone. 5% of it, a, a little bit, gets through. So it's, it's, the radioactivity is low, but you know that there is some transfer. Well, what does that mean? This is a, you'll see this slide again in various forms. All I'm doing is sketching out for you what's going on. Here's my tritiated, my labeled dihydroxyacetone phosphate. There's the base pulling off the tritium and to give you the tritiated enzyme. Here's the indiol. Now, if there were transfer, if the, that base just simply put, it, put that tritium back onto the middle carbon, carbon two, then of course this bottom line would be transfer, but we only see 5% of that. So only 5% goes here. 95% goes up where, in, since we're in unlabeled water, that tritium is lost, is, is exchanges, is washed out, um, uh, and hydrogen is put back, uh, is there, and then hydrogen rather than tritium ends up. So ends up in the product. So what I'm saying is simply, here, 95 goes up here, and 5 goes there. Another way of saying that is that A and B, this thing and that thing, are in equilibrium. It almost, not complete, I didn't say 100, 0, but 95, 5 is pretty extreme. I'm saying that what that's telling us is that A and B are in equilibrium with one another. The enzyme, th that tritium, equilibrates with the solvent. And that tells us something. Uh, that, that says that the new hydrogen is derived from the solvent. The new proton comes 
not from here, but it comes out of the solvent, 95% of it. All right? So let's confirm that by doing the opposite experiment. Let's start with unlabeled material and do it in tritiated water and see how much tritium there is there, there, and therefore there. When we do that, when we do that, you can see that the specific radioactivity is, well, now it's three quarters, but you know, that's pretty good. Um, that's basically telling us that the new hydrogen is derived from the solvent. It confirms the previous thing. You see what m the previous experiment, you see what um, I, we've done? We started with labeled substrate in unlabeled water and got an answer. And we confirmed it by using unlabeled substrate in labeled water and get the same answer. So, uh, but it's more, as you will see in a second, more interesting than that. Because let's ask ourselves, sorry, a little uh, uh, more about this. Um, the specific radioactivity is, that is, the, the proportion, specific radioactivity, I should have said, is the proportion of this that is tritium. So 75% compared with the solvent. That is um, uh, labeled about 75% as strongly as the solvent is. However, as Betsy taught you last week, and this is what we're doing now, we're having unlabeled substrate <coughs> in tritiated water. So we're coming in up here, we're making the ene diol. We know that A and B are in equilibrium, so we're expecting now, whatever the proportion of H2O and T2O tritium is in the, in the solvent, that will be reflected in the proportion of tritium on, in these places. If it's a hydrogen there, we'll get a hydrogen there. If it's a tritium there, we'll get a tritium there. But when you look at this, I've just told you that the product has about 75% is the specific activity of the solvent. And yet, you know from last week that it's much tougher, slower, to transfer a tritium than it is to transfer a hydrogen. Tritium is a heavier isotope. There's an isotope effect. It is slower by, let's say, guess, between 6 and 20 times slower to take this tritium off than it is to transfer that tritium than to transfer that hydrogen. Heavy isotopes don't like being transferred. And let's say you expect a 6, mm, somewhere between 6 and 20. I mean, it varies depending on the reaction. And so we've got a problem because since that has got to be much, much less than that, say 10 as a, as a guess, uh, somewhere between 6 and 20, there should be 10 times less going this way than is going that way. So even though A and B are in equilibrium, there ought to be much less tritium in D than hydrogen in C. But I've just told you there isn't. I mean, this is 75%. And therefore, the difference, this isotope effect, must be irrelevant. It must, it's got to exist. I'm not going to say there isn't one. But it must be irrelevant, and that's what these little arrows mean. It must be that there's some other step that's, rate, that's determining the rate of the reaction, and that, in fact, A, B, C, and D are all in equilibrium, and that these are just all in a happy equilibrium, um, and that the rate-limiting step is this. Well, what is that? That could be the off step. That could be the, this is the product after all. And so what else has got to happen to it? Well, nothing, except it's got to fall off the enzyme uh, uh, and free into solution. And here is a, this is trying to pictorialize for you uh, what I've just said to you. And I should, I should uh, assure you that what Professor Comey told you last week is, of course, absolutely correct. 
um, and I am being slightly naughty. Um, we are, we do know, she told you, didn't she, that um, if that is hydrogen, the, some reaction, then if I have a heavy isotope, it has a lower, um, a lower ground state free energy and it goes over the same or the same-ish hump. Um, and since this dashed free energy of activation is larger than that one, uh, this is, let's say, tritium and that's hydrogen, the tritium goes slower. And that's the proper way. I, it's awfully, the, the diagrams get awfully messy so what I, if you do it like this, so what I've done is to move up the dashed line, the dotted line, so I represent the isotope effect um, like that, meaning that, and it's absolutely, be assured, it doesn't affect the argument, it just makes it so much easier to see. It's just tritium, if there's a label, it's, sorry, I didn't use the point here, hydrogen, more high, high, it's easier to go over the lower barrier than tritium to go over the high barrier. That's just, I didn't want you to be muddled about <coughs> what you'd heard correctly last week. Here we are, and we're going to see a number of these um, in different forms. Um, here's the substrate. OK, it binds to the enzyme. When I have a dashed line, it means I don't really know anything about that and don't want to talk about it for the moment. So here is the enzyme substrate complex. That's when the proton is being pulled off, and I'm getting to the ene diol, and there's A and B, and there's um, the equilibrium. That's to show the equilibrium with the solvent of BH or BT in the previous slide. What we have just learned is that, yes, there is an isotope effect. There's hydrogen being delivered to the product to form the product, and there's tritium more slowly. So I'm not denying there's an isotope effect, but I'm saying because we don't see any discrimination, at least 75%, there must be some later step is rate limiting. And let's have that. The only step that there is is the off step. And there's this, we're going in the left to right in the blue direction. And here I'm pictorially illustrating the fact that A, B, and C, D are all in equilibrium. It doesn't matter. There's an isotope effect there, but who cares? Nobody can see it um, uh, because the, it is the off step there that is rate limiting. That's, as I say, pictorializing uh, uh, the uh, going to the right direction. Let's go to the left. California is appropriate. Um, so now I'm, go I'm starting here on the right and going to the left. According to the picture I've just drawn, we should expect, shouldn't we, uh, according to this picture, that here I bind to the enzyme, my, the base pulls off the, the proton, uh, I'm, I get to this intermediate which equilibrates, this is A and B, with the solvent. Um, but now, if it will be easier to deliver hydrogen to make DHAP than it would to deliver tritium to make DHAP. So that I might expect going right to left, m many more molecules to go over there, picking up hydrogen than over there, so that the radioactivity, the amount of radioactivity in the product would be lower. I would expect that because many more ordinary molecules, cold ones, will go over than will hot ones picking up tritium and making it radioactive. So here, and that indeed, I wouldn't have told you, of course, if it hadn't been like that. <laughs> here are the results recapitulated. Uh, when I go in the blue direction, I, as I've told you, the most of the <coughs> isotope uh, is it's almost the same as the solvent, 75%. When I go right to left, in the red direction, it's only 11%. So that um, what, you're, what we're saying is that there's an isotope effect. What's 1 over 75? It's 
what's one, 100 over 11 is 9. So there's an isotope effect of about 9. And so if I just go back here, I'm saying that's about a nine-fold difference. Um, so now what we've, t and I'm now summarizing this chunk, and it's, I hope, going to get easier. Those of you who are now too bemused by discriminations uh, may can, can um, join us again. <laughs> um, going left to right, I'm only just doing these half bits. We see discrimination. We see little discrimination, essentially none. So the offset must be rate limiting. This transition state must be higher than that. That's irrelevant. Yet going in the other direction, we do see an isotope effect of about eight or nine. So that isn't high. This is the high. The isotope step is the high one. That's what we've learned. So we've learned sort of two bits. We've learned bits about two. <coughs> you see, we've, we've learned about this bit of the reaction from the endial east, and about this bit of the reaction from the endial west. But now, I, how, do I put, how do I put these together? How do I join them together? How do I know how that these two peaks relate to those two peaks? Because heaven knows, I might say, look, well, that's an endial, that's an endial, let's just put them together. I don't actually know there's not some subtle changes in there and another intermediate and so on. So how do I put these two bits together? Well, we've got a very interesting situation at the same time. That is, we've got, and I'm simplifying this here um, with just A and B, but you've got a, in a sense, a way of feeding a label, an isotopic label, feeding a, message, a messenger into the middle of the reaction. So let's say you had a reaction of A to B. And let's say it was like this, with the first peak low and the second peak high. We're going to do the, other, the opposite in a minute. I mean, in principle, after all, um, there are only two uh, for a simple reaction like that. It's either like that or it's like that, if I'm going A to B, isn't it? So let's, let's ask the simple question. Well, which is it? So I've got two half reactions. Well, if let's allow there to be an intermediate, which I suppose I could have called I here, um, to be consistent with what I've drawn on the board. And let's say that, as we know, that exchanges, that's supposed to be a picture of a pool. Um, uh, that's the solvent, right? It, it's supposed to look like a bit of a lake. All right. So what I'm really saying is, if I have a reaction here that goes to an intermediate that now can exchange with the solvent, and if I put deuterium or tritium label in the solvent, I can ask, look, let's stop the reaction at half time, when half of A has gone to B. Well, what will have happened? Well, A will have visited there and come back out. There will be, if I look at this board here, there will be a would have gone in and come back and gone in, and only occasionally will it go over there. So it will have come in to I, exchanged, of course. There's an exchange reaction with the solvent going on here. So it will have come in, visited, gone back, and lots of times before it actually managed to get over and make the product. So you would expect, in the case on the left, that if I stop the reaction at half time, A will have visited here so often that the, its radioactivity, let's say that its isotope, will be nearly the same as the solvent. Whereas in this case, on the right, I don't care. It, once the cyst A has staggered over this high hump, it's coming zooming down here. Imagine you're skiing. You know, you're not going to pause here uh, in order to exchange. You're going to go zooming over there um, and um, onto the product so that, in fact, you wouldn't expect to see any isotope, uh, any of the solvent message, if you will, back in the remaining starting material, because the partitioning is all forward uh, and 
almost none of it back. All right? That will allow us, doing this, um, will allow us to solve the problem. So we did this reaction in the blue direction, <coughs> left to right. Um, and this is what we saw. Uh, let me just remind you, this is what we expected. We expected either something flat along the bottom or something which shot up to the top and stayed there. And we didn't see that. We saw something much more interesting. Um, this is the amount of exchange and that's the amount of conversion. If you like, I could have labeled the ordinate, I could have labeled that backwards <coughs> and that forwards. Because what this means is, at the beginning of the reaction, the gradient of that is, what would you say, about a third? It's not a half. It's not one. That's saying <coughs> that at the beginning of the reaction, and it's, it's tilting down towards the conversion. It's saying three molecules are going over and one is coming back. <coughs> so just remember, three over, one back. Now, the one that's coming back has got tritium on it. Otherwise, I wouldn't know it had come back. So it's, it's, it's having to a harder job coming back. But three over, three forward, one back is what that says at the beginning. And that's, we could account for that. But then, is quite a worry. Then this is, this is uh, going crazy. It's, uh, the radioactivity is going up. It looks as if it's going to be higher than the solvent. I mean, what on earth is this? This is ridiculous. How could, how could the, the reaction sort of purify tritium <laughs> from the solvent? Um, and so we, that, that really was actually, I will admit to you, <laughs> the poor graduate student. It, one has to be, one has to be, grateful and sympathetic with graduate students because supervisors who think they understand or who, and which may be even worse, supervisors who know they don't understand say, it must be impossible, go back and do it again. You must do that again. You must have got it wrong. And certainly the poor student that did this, I'm afraid, <laughs> um, did a lot of experiments <laughs> because I said no, you're, something is wrong. This is impossible. You cannot use an enzyme catalyzed reaction to purify isotopes. Uh, I mean, you know, Oak Ridge or Los Alamos does that. We don't in a, uh, our test tubes. Anyway, that's, so we've got to explain it. We've got to explain it. So let's do the, let's, one at a time, let's do the beginning bit first. Three over, so we're saying, going in the blue direction, we come in, we come in here, as we've, remember we're in unlabeled water, so we come in over there. An, an isotope washes in now. And all we've determined from the beginning of that reaction is that three molecules go over, ah, and one comes back. So that the diff this is a bit higher by about threefold than that, because three go forward and one comes back with tritium on, so of course it's the higher hump. All right? That's the beginning of the reaction. That's explained that, and that's very lovely because now you see we've, we've, we've um, established the relationship between these two peaks and those two peaks, which is what we wanted to do. But what about this, this curve that's going shooting up? Well, let's just think. After a little while, what's happened to this? It's, this started all protons, all hydrogen. No label at all. The label was in the solvent. So, but after a little while, a quarter of the molecules that went in came back with tritium on it. So now, at the beginning, it, at, let's say after half of the reaction, you've got both unlabeled and labeled ones now. And so, now think what about those. How are they going to get in? Well, they've got, they bind to the enzyme. Hydrogen ones get in easier. Tritium ones get in more, with more difficulty. So there's a constant preferential selection out of the H molecules, leaving the Ts behind. And so the radioactivity of what is left behind goes up and up and up and up. And indeed, yes, it would be very inefficient but Los Alamos could use this. <laughs> it would be horrendous. But um, uh, this is indeed 
uh, a, a um, selection uh, against tritium, uh, leaving that, in a sense, you're doing two things. Your three molecules are going over, one is coming back with tritium on it. And he, that fellow, is constantly being left behind because he can't get back in so easily. And so that uh, picture, uh, that picture is now, we can explain in these two ways. So now, and it's, we're nearly, we're, we're getting, we're going to get there. It's all right. If, I mean, I'm, I, look, I worry about faces um, uh, that, um, you know, if you lose, if, you, if I lose you, how am I going to get you back? <laughs> Um, if, if, if you, you know, these, these pictures are now um, getting too awful, but it's all right, it's going to, we're coming to another pause point in a minute, so cheer up. Um, I'm going to do exactly the same exchange conversion experiment, this experiment, going in the red direction, left, uh, right to left. <coughs> so this is starting on the right and going to the left. And now it's much more, there's a little bit of turn up here, but it's, it's actually, interestingly, about the same. It's about three over, three forward and one back. Again. So it's three forward and one back with tritium on it. So let, how can we account for that? Well, starting here on the right, we come, we bind to the enzyme, we come in here, this is all equilibrium, we pick up the, la the isotopic label, the tritium from the solvent washes in, and what happens? We go forward, and this is 99.99% of the molecules are unlabeled anyway. Tritium is over only a tracer. So three go forward, and one comes back. And so the difference between that and that is about threefold. All right? Three forward, one back. Three forward, one back. And then you remember, I hope, that when we were going in the blue direction, it was C forward, one back. So that I said, that is three times that, higher than that. And now, from this experiment, I'm saying that is three times higher than that. Three times three is nine. And that is very satisfying. Nine, that's like an isotope effect, isn't it? Like a tritium isotope effect. And didn't we find any way before that it, we thought it was eight or nine, 11 percent? That's nine. Is, so all I'm trying to say is I'm trying to show you that things are all coming together now, that we're beginning to overdetermine the nature of all of these uh, valleys and hills, and are getting reasonably happy. I'm going to have one last couple of experiments before it gets easier. And that is, I've only talked about tritium. And some of you, and it takes a little while, Betsy. Yeah, none of you have interrupted. What's the matter with you? Yes. I just wanted to reiterate, because this is, it took me the longest time to understand this. How when you're going in one direction is it three forward one back and then when you're going in the other direction it's three forward one back yeah. and it's because in one case in, when you're going from right to left you're going forward with an H and in the other case you're going back with a T yeah. and that's why the numbers match with the ice okay in case anybody lost that it, it, yeah it is it just it, is so confusing it is how can you um, go in both directions Yes, how, that's right. How can you possibly go with three forward, one back in both directions? Well, because they're different. <laughs> because the back is always with tritium on it. And so, and I should actually, um, let's just, um, uh, that, was, that was in the blue direction. So starting here where I'm standing, three forward, one back with tritium on it. And it, it has, it's, uh, I don't see it if it hasn't got tritium on it. I can't, you know, that doesn't respond in the scintillation counter. <laughs> um, so that is the three that Betsy is quite rightly reiterating. Three forward, one back. And then when I, when we go 
this way, three forward, one back. It has tritium on it because it came over there, but that we don't, that, that's as we've shown, that's irrelevant. So there's three forward, one back in that direction, because, and these are because they're different humps, different bumps. Let's do something simpler. <laughs> um, let's use deuterium. deuterium. Why is deuterium simpler? Because when I put D in a place, it's all D there. It, and I haven't got to bear in mind that, well, I've got, I've got competition between H and... No, 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 no. It's D. Um, so here are, um, even though your dear professor may be horrified that I am showing, above all... Uh, uh, of all people showing you lime weaver Burke plots, <laughs> double reciprocal plots, she's probably told you they're dreadful and you should be very careful and they're misleading and don't worry too much. This is, these are fine. <laughs> um, what we did was just, now none of these complicated quenching experiments or stopping them in the middle, you just start, you, uh, you take the all hydrogen reaction, uh, which is, um, there, and you just measure the velocity, the, the, how fast you just do a classical experiment, and you plot, and you get a kcat and a km, and then you make that one with deuterium. It's all deuterium there. How would you make it? How did I make that? I mean, I didn't buy it. Sigma Aldrich does not sell stereoselectively deuterated dihydroxyacetone phosphate. <laughs> now, there isn't much of a market for it. <laughs> it's true. No, of course, what I did was just to take unlabeled material with a pinch of enzyme in D2O and let it run, leave it overnight. And of course, it exchanges it all out. Now I've got stereospecifically, and then I isolate the stuff again, uh, and freeze dry, take off the solvent, and I've got um, Stereos, this particular material that I want. And it was done in pure D2O, so it's, it's all <coughs> deuterium. And there, you can see, even if, you don't, if you're not intuitive in interpreting uh, these double reciprocal plots, have they done double reciprocal plots? Yes. Yes. Um, you can see there's a difference. <laughs> there's a nice step effect. And if I go in the red direction with deuterium there, there isn't. So, you know, what is going on? I, I mean, this, uh, I can assure you, this, this was uh, Peter, wasn't it? Ledley. Um, this poor devil, <laughs> uh, this poor graduate student, who's now a distinguished professor in Cambridge, England, and it's all lovely, but he had an awful time with me as a graduate student because he had to go back and do it again and again. I could not believe. I said, look, it's washed out or something. You, you can't have made this stuff. Um, you must have be, you're comparing H with H. Of course it's the same, <laughs> you half-wit. It, they've got to be different. And I went on and on, and um, <laughs> in the end we realized that actually he was right. His experiments were perfect, and just what we'd expect. We just weren't thinking um, clearly enough. Let's first look at the uh, blue direction. In the blue direction, um, uh, what have we got? Well, what do we expect from the profile, the, the picture, the bumps and dips you've been seeing? Here we've got deuterated substrate. It binds. Uh, obviously, if it's deuterium, it's got a harder job going over. And there is an isotope effect. This is about 3-ish, uh, 2.9 or 3, and that's fine. Uh, and then it goes on, and that's all. You would expect an isotope effect like that and because of the slower reaction of the deuterated substrate, and you see a nice type effect. <coughs> Fine. What the puzzle, as I just said, was coming from right to left. Why is there no isotope effect in deuterium? You see, there's nothing. I mean, detectable. Well, actually, from what you already, what I've told you, which of course is a lot more than we understood when we were doing that experiment, um, uh, if only we'd, I'd been intelligent enough to realize, I'd have said, of course, that's what we expect. Looking back, I'm rather pleased because, um, you know, we absolutely know. 
confirmed and cross-confirmed that there is none. Um, but you, you now will realize you would not expect an isotope effect because going from right to left. Because, of course, here is the deuterated material on the right. It binds the enzyme, comes in here. It loses its deuterium. The deuterium washes out into the solvent. It goes to and fro, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, N, lots of times, because it can't get out these two high humps. are just letting it wash. All the isotope washes out. And so now, what is it? It's just a hydrogen. And so on it goes. There's no label left. So it behaves exactly as hydrogen. And the rate of the reaction, that's not isotopic dependent, nor is that. I mean, that would be, but there isn't any isotope left. That's the isotopic step, but it's kinetically irrelevant. So we don't expect an isotope effect from the, having carefully put the deuterium in there. We give it to the enzyme. The enzyme washes it out and processes it at exactly the same rate. Uh. Well, that's, I think, the last free energy profile. No, nearly the last one I'm going to show you. Um, I've, there are about 16 possible experiments. And I've described to you um, uh, seven, I think, um, the kind of experiments I haven't, I mean, uh, I, involving isotopes. The kind of experiments I haven't described are, well, let's start with deuterated glyceraldehyde phosphate, run it halfway, re-isolate this. What is the, you know, there are some other experiments you can do, and a number we did do. Um, but all I want to suggest to you that is that um, I want to give you a sense of what kinds of things you can do with a very simple reaction if um, you are fortunate enough, which I believe, and we can discuss that later, is a characteristic of enzyme reactions, that the bumps and the dips are all rather even. In any case, putting all of this stuff together, and after 40 pages of algebra, um, and I'm quite proud not to have given you one equation this morning, um, but because I do feel it's much more important for, for you to um, have a f conceptual feel <coughs> for what might be going on, rather than an alge a purely algebraic feel, Aside from anything else, the algebra is horrendous. I couldn't do it. I collaborated with a marvelous physical chemist called John Albury, who, as it were, had kinetic equations for breakfast. I mean, he, he, he just <coughs> lusted after kinetics. I did not. So it was a wonderful collaboration. Collaborate always in your lives with people who can't do what you can do. Um, and who can do what you can't do. Then the collaborations work. If you start collaborating with people who you think, oh, wait a minute, I can do that, then you start nudging them out, and it ceases to be a true collaboration. But if it's a true juxtaposition of incompetence, <laughs> um, then it works. And that was true in our case. John Albrecht couldn't do experiments to save his life. Um, I mean, dreadful. But, but I can't do, I mean, don't give me too many double integrals and um, kinetic equations. I, I just, yes, anyway. What the result of all this was, was that. Um, and that isn't, I mean, there are some things we don't know, actually, and these are more doubtful. That's a bit um, overhopeful and so on. But here you have. The, the beginnings, that is all the rate constants. I told you I, there are four steps, uh, binding, one inalization, the other inalization backwards, and the off step. Here is the whole, for the first time, the first, it was then for the first time, the, a free energy profile for a reaction, all the rate constants. Now, as I said at the beginning, just rate constants, so what? You can look at these numbers. And in fact, that's how they first came out of John Albury's um, 
mincing machine, algebraic mincer, he just gave, he said, well, you know, Jeremy, it's very exciting. This is 10 to the 4 per second, nearly 10 to the 5. And I said, uh-huh, mm-hmm, mm -hmm. mm, good. <laughs> I'm so pleased. Um, uh, you know, having the numbers in a table, and it, I was at home one night um, with these numbers, and I thought, I mean, I can't. You know, I'm very pleased. Part of me is very pleased to have the numbers uh, and to know for the first time. But so what? I mean, they're numbers. And I decided I, I had to plot. I wanted to pictorialize them, which I've been doing for you, of course, all this morning. Uh, but what happened when I, when I, you can imagine having these, I should have made a slide with just these numbers in a table and asked you what you thought they might mean. <laughs> because, of course, OK, nothing. <laughs> um, but when you plot them like this, when you make a curve um, uh, of uh, free energy um, uh, uh, as, the, as the scale, then you do begin to see something that's rather interesting. Particularly, uh, you, I told you, asked you at the beginning to remember that number, 4 times 10 to the 8 molar to the minus 1 per second. That's k cat over km, so it's the starting state over the highest hump, which is that. We know that's higher than that by threefold. Um, so that's k cat over km, the second order, pseudo second order rate constant, going from right to, to left. That number happens to be very close, I mean, it's within the range of the span of diffusion controlled reactions. That is, the rate at which two molecules in water find each other. And what does that mean? Well, that must be a maximum for any reaction in solution. You can't react faster than you can find each other. You can't have a uh, and A reacting with B faster than they can get together. And the, so that if a reaction, a bimolecular reaction, a reaction between two molecules in water is going at this rate, it can't get any faster. Because how could it? <laughs> um, you'd, you'd, they'd, uh, this would have to be action at a distance or something. We don't, we don't allow that in chemistry. Um, the, they have to find each other. And then the reaction happens. And, it, and you can see, as soon as these two find each other at this speed, everything's over, going from right to left. And so let's think about that. I'm going to go past that for a second. Um, let's just simplify the reaction, the, the thinking for a moment. Let's have a reaction of A and B. And I'm simplifying it with no intermediate. So I'm just, this is a very, very simple reaction. <laughs> None more simple than I know. But let's say that, and this is something as like we have seen, that all of the, it, for Tim, that the, this barrier is the highest, and this um, valley is the lowest of them all. You saw a moment ago, did you not? This, of course, this distance between there and there is the equilibrium constant for the reaction. And of course, the enzyme can't, doesn't affect an equilibrium constant. Um, a and B, the, the chemical nature of A and B determines the free energy difference between them. All the enzyme is doing, or the catalyst is doing, is interconverting. But if you wanted the perfect catalyst, what could you do? What could you not do, I should say? Well. I'm suggesting the one thing you can't do, that that is a barrier you can't lower. And this is a barrier you can't lower. And so if we go back to primordial time, here is Tim in the solid line. All right? Uh, and I'm sorry, that rate constant is going from right to left, and don't worry about it. But. Um, uh, it's only going right to left because that one is too. If we imagine the primordial soup before Tim, before life, how fast were DHAP and GAP and GAP interconverted? Well, we can do model experiments. People have done model experiments to say, let's have a base like 
imidazole um, or no, not, acetic acid is too strong an acid, um, maybe a thiol, but it was in fact I think an imidazole, um, uh, a, a base. To say, that if I spoon some of that into the solution at pH 7, I'll, I can measure a rate of interconversion of DHAP and GAP, and we know actually now that it goes via an indiol, and you can draw, and that would be another lecture, but a free energy profile for that. So that was up here. Th these are the barriers that were there in primordial times before life. So what has happened since then, over the last four billion years, well, life began, let's say, three billion years ago, so three and a half, three and a half billion, but you're not going to argue with me, I hope, about half a billion, um, is that all of the barriers, the free energy barriers, have been lowered to just lower than that. Just lower than that. And all of these valleys have been lowered, but none of them lower than that. Right? And that, I'm saying to you, um, is, uh, suggests that this enzyme is perfect. It couldn't get any better. Each time I lower, let's say that's the highest barrier, if I lowered that by 1.4 kilocalories per mole, the reaction would speed up 10 times. Another one, 10 times. Another one, 10 times. And you can see that there's about a 10 to the 10 fold. I, I, I need 10 orders of magnitude. Tim is more efficient than imidazole by about 10 orders of magnitude. So, and you can see, as I come down, each time I gain 10. Until I get to about here, when this is nearly there, if I, uh, w when this is a little bit lower than that barrier, which I am saying cannot be eroded, because it's di it is limited by diffusion, no amount of evolution is going to make molecules swim faster, or diffusion happen faster, you can live for another four billion years and you won't get f better than that unless each molecule starts to develop, develop <laughs> fins or something. Um, but once, if I improve that by 1.4 kilocalories, do I get another tenfold in the rate? No. Do I get anything in the rate? Actually, if I have two exactly the same, and I take one out of it, I gain a factor of two. But that's all. So I've been getting 10, 10, 10, 10, mm, a bit, and then if this disappears, two. And thereafter, there's no point in making, there's no point in making that any lower, has no effect on the rate at all. Um, and so what I am suggesting to you, that the ends, this enzyme, because has made, uh, has that, that, that four billion years is enough, and that Tim is perfect, and of course we now know, this was the first one, but we now know a lot of enzymes that are not, I should caution you, are nothing to do, don't have other jobs like control or, you know, this is, Tim is just wants to be fast. Once you want to have metabolic control, that slows things down and as you know, for traffic lights. If you wanted to, to get from here um, uh, across campus even, uh, no, well, let's go downtown, and you want to take no notice of all stop signs and all traffic lights, you get there faster. Control does cost you a bit in speed. Uh, and we allow control for other reasons in traffic as well as in metabolism. Um, it's just as well. but. Um, there are, for those enzymes that are not responsible for biological control, that are just catalysts, uh, and this is what Tim is, once you have lowered the, all the other steps below this, then you are as good as you can get. Um, lowering this further won't affect you, and provided that these, which I haven't gone into, that these states are not very stable. If this was, was down here, then of course the enzyme would fall into that free energy well and just sit there and get tied up. So you've got to not to have any of these 
valleys too low, uh, any lower than the more stable of the two. And so we end with my last slide, um, essentially, by saying this is where we began. And I'm forgive my biblical, um, uh, uh, those of you who have ever sung in the Messiah um, will know every valley shall be exalted and every hill shall be made low. And when I was making this slide, I thought, that's just what's happening. <laughs> um, but um, uh, no, forget the biblical reference. But you can see here is some, uh, what I've called a primordial enzyme, imidazole. And keeping these steps, this is exactly the same as that, or it's supposed to be, and that the same as that. These on-off steps, or these on steps, these are diffusion limited in each case. But once I've, re I've lowered that barrier and raised these intermediates, then I can't get any better. Then the reaction cannot go any faster. And we called it evolutionary perfection. Well, perfection was a bit, a bit sinful, perhaps, to call it perfection. And yet, and yet, if something can't get any better, isn't it perfect? <laughs> that was my view. Um, that if it, since it could not get any better, this was perfect. Uh, this was perfection. And I should end by saying, I believe that, uh, you know, while there are, lot, there, there are lots of enzymes that in the thermodynamically downhill direction, you can find many for yourselves. When you look <coughs> at the rate constants in the thermodynamically downhill direction, which for the way I've drawn it is right to left, if the k cat over km is 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9, molar to the minus 1 per second, then it's one of these. It's a perfect enzyme. And uh, the only caveat is that we must be careful not to presume that every enzyme is there merely to be a catalyst. Some enzymes are there, as I've said, to control and corral and partition intermediates and make things happen uh, in a special way, in a, a, a more orderly way. Um, that then is as much as you're going to know or be allowed to know about, um, um, oh, you can, I don't, I put that in um, just to um, cheer you up. <laughs> Um, uh, it is true what Mr. Stanier said, be careful of those people. So I'm telling you, be careful of Professor Knowles who starts talking to you about evolution. It, it can become a vice. Uh, be careful of it in yourselves. But on Thursday, what we're going to do is to take what you've seen. We won't actually discuss it, uh, but I'm going to give you some the clothes, the structures, what things are, what groups are being used, who's, who's doing what, who's moving those protons, how are they moving in structural terms so that you know, you can imagine how it might be that you would have gone, uh, what you would have designed to lower this and to raise these and what the enzyme actually looks like in real terms. Okay.